Good morning, folks. Today is our last Saturday or Sunday, uh, last Saturday morning here. Uh, we are looking at um, John 15, 1 through 8. Joining God's work is a kind of blessing. And our point that we want to make today is believers are to join God's work, both in the church and in the world. Let's have a moment of prayer before we begin and we'll get started. Good kind of gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this day to uh, study your word. And I pray as a humble servant, you will give me the words to say. Do not give me any little rhetoric to uh, better understand and explain what I've read and what I've said. But be with us now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you were with us a few moments ago, you probably heard us testing our new equipment. We're using some new broadcast equipment and uh, we're hoping it's going to better our efforts to reach our church and community, so please be patient with us when we have times that we are doing this. So, we begin with a question before we look at anything today, and it's when has a task looked bigger than your ability to get it done? Uh, I think of one thing that comes to mind that uh, the last 10 or so years since I retired from teaching, I've been doing home repairs, and done lots of little jobs that uh, we're within my, as I say, my comfort zone. Built decks, changed out windows and doors, and pulled bathroom floors and that sort of thing. And uh, my helper and I were talking one day, and I said, you know, I sure would like an opportunity to do it all. Just do it all. And a friend of his reached out to us and said, I've got uh, a rental house, and I want it redone, start to finish. Well, we started in August, but we finished in January. And there was like a couple of hurricanes through there, uh, my mom passed away through there. There was a couple of snows that came that year through that time period. But it was an uh, overwhelming task. And I, I really felt that I could do it. We just never felt we were going to get finished with it. Uh, there's other things that face us that may or may not be in our comfort zone. But sometimes not being in our comfort zone does not mean we cannot get those done. And one of those is when God calls us to serve, uh, he will help us through it. Some jobs sound harder than others. Uh, I think we'd all agree that it uh, feels like brain surgery, teaching advanced physics would top the list. But what about ministry? Some of you ministry is one of the hardest jobs out there. And you know, I, I agree. So much about ministry that is difficult. But it's most difficult if we're trying to do it on our own. That's what today's lesson is really all about. Uh, the author talks about the, the night that he was ordained. He said he sat on the steps of his college dormitory. Something about the formal ceremony had jolted him into reality. He says, I knew that, I, that pastoring was a big task for a young person like me. But I also had a calm yet cautious confidence that I could do this. It wasn't because of my education or experience. I had little either. Neither did my confidence come from naive optimism. It came from knowing that I would not be doing this alone. God would be working through me. You may never be formally ordained in the ministry, but you are called ministers. Every follower of Christ is called a minister. We do not need to fear the work, the same confidence that our author found applies to all believers. We are called and we are not alone. Being around the church and, and, and following up with different activities or different uh, projects we have done here at the church, somebody will come up that doesn't know us, oh, well, you're the pastor, and I'm not saying, no, it's quite a compliment, but that's not me. But we are all pastors of this church if we do what we're supposed to do. We're all ministers in the uh, work of the Lord. We begin. In verse uh, John chapter 15, verses 1, 2, and 3, uh, if you have your Bibles or electronic devices or whatever, please, if you have your uh, Sunday school literature, and if you do not have a copy of Sunday school literature, and, and maybe that you're you know, choosing not to come in for worship, you're in drive-in worship, or maybe you're just doing your worship from home, but you like a copy of our Sunday school literature, um, somebody tell me, I think this is the last month on this literature, isn't it? We start new literature in March. But if you'll let us know, reach out to us. Uh, contact the pastor, contact myself or John or anybody, Rhonda. Uh, we'll see if you can get a copy. And that way you can follow along with what uh, 
our different Sunday school uh, leaders are teaching. I'm on page 150 in the adult quarterly, and that's a, a student version. I am the true vine. I can pause right there. That's a that's a loaded statement. May not seem to you, but after you study a bit, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. He's the vine dresser. He's uh, uh, he takes care of it all. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Last year, we were getting everything ready to move across the road to the house, and there was lots of stuff to be done inside, lots of stuff to be done outside. We had three uh, very, very, very large, uh, I call them rhododendrons, my wife called them something else, but they were huge. They were like rooftop huge. And I said, something has got to be done. So she and I went in there and I took a chainsaw and I just cut them off for about a waist high. Somebody sent me word that I had butchered those plants and they would die. Well, if you go to my house today, they are loaded with blooms. I don't know if they'll get to bloom this early in the year, but they are loaded with blooms. We've got a few, two or three blooms on there. But the, the buds are there. <clears throat> would that have happened if I hadn't cut it back? I don't think so. That's part of the process. You've got to trim things back to make them grow sometimes. In the Gospel of John, we see seven <clears throat> I am statements Jesus made about himself. I am the bread of life. Chapter 6, verse 35 and 48. I am the light of the world. 8, 12. I am the door. 10, 7, and 9. I am the good shepherd. 10, 4, 11, and 14. I am the resurrection and the life. Chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 14, 6. I am the true mind. 15, 1. And what's really significant about I am, more so than most people may not realize, if you remember in Exodus 3, 14, where God instructed Moses to tell those who inquire who is this that you worship, and he says, I am. I am sent him to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. I am is the essence of the word Yahweh. The name expressing God's covenantal relationship with the Jews. The seven I am statements in the Gospel of John identify Jesus with God. The one who sent Moses to do his work, Exodus 3.10. The one who sent Jesus, John 17.3. The one who sent the Holy Spirit in 15.26. The one who sends us, 20.21. The one that sent John the Baptist who came and foretold of Jesus coming. The ones that sent pastors and missionaries and laypersons to bring the gospel to you. Maybe not to lead people to Christ, but to plant that seed that somebody else will come in their life and answer the questions they need answered and that will help this grow. A new branch. A new branch. When Jesus said he is the true vine, he signaled that he was fulfilling the purpose that Israel did. Now Israel being the nation of Jews that we know. Many Old Testament writers use the vine as a metaphor for Israel, God's covenant people. Sadly, in most of these instances, Israel was a vine that failed to bear fruit. How many times did the children of Israel get in trouble, plead for God's help, he got them out of captivity, he brought them back, just for them to praise God for a little while? Pastor and I were talking about this lesson. He said, you know, 9-11, we all that are above a certain age will remember it. The churches were full for six weeks, at least here at Shady Grove, for a good six to seven weeks, the church was full. And then after that, it didn't, and it wasn't a trip. It was almost a spigot turnoff. Folks went back home. They were back in the comfort zone. They didn't feel threatened anymore. But while they felt threatened, just like the children of Israel, while they felt threatened, they turned to God. And when they said, well, maybe it's not as bad as I think it is, they went home. It's sad. But it happened. It happened. However, Jesus did not do it alone. <clears throat> he, produced, he produces fruit through the branches. And that's when we come in. Believers who are God's co-workers. 
And that comes from 1 Corinthians 3 9. In God's grand design, He works through believers to do good works according to His will, Ephesians 2 10. Jesus, the vine, produces the fruit through the branches under the watchful care of the garden. Think about any tree that produces fruit. You got the stalk, you got the stump, you got the main part of that tree, the main part of that vine. There's not going to be any fruit on the side of that. But once it puts out the branches, and more likely than not, the closer to the end of those branches is where we're going to find the fruit. We're going to grow. We've got, got to have those branches to develop. Those branches have got to be there. Jesus, the vine, produces the fruit through the branches under the watchful eye of the gardener. And there's God. The Father is the gardener who trims and prunes the branches. He does this to increase the fruit-bearing capacity of the branches so that they will bear more fruit. In an analogy, the branches do not decide to bear fruit. I have to stop and think about that one for a minute. Branches don't decide to bear fruit. If we are connected to the vine, we will bear fruit. It's a natural outcome of being connected. It goes with that, can you earn your salvation? No. But once you get your salvation, do you want to work for God? You should. If you're a new creature in Christ, you should. You should have an outward change that people can recognize that you are a new being. Now, will it all happen at once? No. You've got to grow. You're young. You're a child. you got to grow in Christ. A new, a new branch has got to grow. It doesn't just pop out there. It's got to grow. But, don't you love it when you see in about another month we're going to see all this new bright green. Not dark green, bright green. And bright green represents the new growth coming. And it's going to be beautiful. All these trees around. The oak trees and the maple trees are the ones I love especially. The pin oak. Beautiful. And along that the buds and everything else. But we've got to have that new growth. In his care, though the gardener does not tolerate non-fruit bearing branches. If the father sees the branches not bearing fruit, he removes it. He severs it from the vine. I had a little bit of a lot of thinking and praying. We are human. And while we may be a new branch, we will make mistakes. And in a moment, I'll tie this to something else. But through the grace of God, we get to come back. Now, it's not like he picks that branch up and puts it back on. He's got to grow back out again. We've got to just grow again. We've got to back up and start a little bit here and there where we've made mistakes. We've got to ask forgiveness. We've got to pray. We've got to read. We've got to study. We've got to get back in. What kind of fruit are we producing? The author gives three different situations. In three different situations that appear throughout the Bible as fruit bearing. Some people equate fruit with evangelical success, meaning how many people do you lead to faith in Christ? You've got to have it. You've got to have it. I think it scares a lot of Christians, especially the new Christians. I, I, don't, I don't feel I have the confidence or the tools to do this. I like to say it. Some people connect fruit to acts of service, meaning ministry you do in the name of Jesus. As a young Christian, you know, there's places for you to bear fruit. But you got to be willing. you got to serve. you gotta, you got to roll up your sleeves and get in there. And some people insist fruit is about personal growth, the character of Jesus that God shapes in you. And that's all well and good. So which is, we see all three in Scripture, as I said, to bear fruit can mean leading people to Jesus, serving them in Jesus' name, and developing the character of Jesus. I won't forget how I struggled as a young Christian when I was in college at the time. And I always struggled about how to witness to reach out to people. And one night a young lady came to me and she said, I want to go for a ride. And I, you know, I was a young man now. I was excited. She wanted to go for a ride. So we went for a ride. I don't know if I've ever told this story. We went for a ride and we ended up down by the lake. And she, we sat there and she said, I want what you've got. And I want what you want. I want what you have. I want Christ in my heart like it's in your heart. That was a whole new outcome for that evening. You know, here I thought maybe when I was developing a relationship with this young lady, and I did. It was a special relationship. For that point forward, we were like buddies in Christ. And it, there's nothing greater. But I had the opportunity to lead her to Christ that it was awesome. And we prayed together many times. And we leaned on each other a lot. But 
Don't always expect it's going to come from you opening the Bible and sharing God's Word. Yes, it happens that way. But sometimes it's all going to be about what you do and how you bear fruit just by living Christ-like. And that, that's another way to look at it. Pray about it. Um, to bear fruit can mean leading people to Christ. It can mean serving them in Jesus' name. It can mean developing the character of Jesus. Our food box ministry is an awesome opportunity. If you struggle with how to reach out and share Christ, trust me, you show up on somebody's doorstep that needs food, they will listen to what you got to say. Now don't expect them grand glorious things because if they got a hunger in their stomach, they're more concerned about feeding that hunger than they are about anything else. But they will know where that box came from. It's not a bad thing when we do food boxes or any other denomination, it's a Christ thing. We are about to increase our number of food boxes this week by 33%. 33%. Over the next five weeks, we've got 40 boxes a week, excuse me, 80 boxes a week, times five, we've got 400 boxes, as the pastor said Wednesday night. That's 400 opportunities to reach somebody in Christ, just by giving them. We're not asking to pay for anything. We're not asking you to pay with money. We're not asking you to pay with time. We're not asking you to pay with church visitation. I mean, uh, coming to church. We're just asking you to give us a moment to share and move on. Over the last year, it uh, seems like a year, I think it started like in late July, we have prayed with a lot of people. Prayed with a lot of people. We've seen a lot of people blessed. Well, my one concern, and I may be jumping out of my lesson here, but my one concern, and I tell everybody, when they say thank you for what you do when you're such a blessing, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm just a tool. Just a tool. The Lord has had his hand in this. That's how you got this. People that that that, that made it happen, but of course God had to bless it. So we're here to bless you and, and we just hope you enjoy what you have. And you know, from mothers raising gosh, somebody was People from other areas in our community, from other churches, from other denominations have, have come by and said, can I get some boxes? I hear you got some, and I've got somebody in my church. Mother raising six children alone. Able to shut in that can't even get out and go do their own grocery shopping. But they're there with the front door open. I don't care if it's 46 degrees and it's raining. With a smile that just won't go away. It's God blessing people. And that's what you can do. Merely giving verbal assent to being Jesus' followers is an act of I'm a Christian. Yeah, okay. What's that? When was the last time God did anything in your heart? Through you, when was the last time you did anything for the Lord? Well, when I was 15, you're 63 years old, man. You can't go back to 6 to 15 years old. You need to stay busy. Life change must happen. And to continue to happen is proof of conversion. And people will see that it's how we influence others to follow Christ. Perform ministry acts in Jesus. Live with a Christ-like spiritual character. <coughs> Moving on. Verses 4 and 5. <coughs> Excuse me. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I am him. The same brings forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. The source of the life is the vine. The only way a branch can bear fruit is to stay connected to the vine. The fruit does not grow directly on the vine, it grows on the branches which are attached to the vine, as I've said before. What a remarkable thought. God works through us to accomplish his purpose in the world. Jesus has chosen to work through us to produce his fruit. God uses it. But only uses, it, uses us if we remain connected to him. Now, as I was struggling to study I was putting so much focus on the example of the vine branches and so forth. But there's a break right here. Now please notice in verse 4. Abide in me and I in you as 
That's right right there. The vine is an example. It's not to be hailed concretely or 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 can't think of the word I'm trying to think. Of, uh, uh, it's not made of stuff. Just like as Christians, there, there are going to be times as the branch we are going to mess up and we're not going to be fruitful. Jesus takes a break here, I think, when he says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. He's breaking away for just a moment. Jesus spoke directly to his disciples when he said, with a forceful command, he told them they must abide in him. He broke loose here for just a moment from the image because it failed to illustrate the point. Unlike branches attached to a vine, believers have a choice of whether or not to remain connected to Christ. <coughs> branches do not have a will. People do. Jesus, in a straightforward, forceful way, commanded us to remain in him. Don't walk away. Don't separate. Don't sever your relationship with Christ. Don't cut yourself away from the vine. Because that's where you get your nutrients. That's where you get everything you need. You can cut a vine and throw it down, and it will still grow a leaf. A branch, excuse me. You can cut a, a branch, and it will still grow a leaf for a short time. It won't grow fruit. It'll grow a leaf, but it won't grow fruit because there's just enough substance there. Don't walk away. Abide means to dwell within something, and it carries the idea of personal, intimate residence. I think of the old the Wild West Cowboys, which, you know, most of them were single gentlemen that worked on a ranch, and they went, and when, when you signed on, you were committed to that rancher. They furnished you a place to stay. They furnished you meals. They took care of you. You took care of them. But you were providing that work that they needed done. They were committed. You took residence there and you worked. We are taking residence in heaven. And we're working to show the world what Christ can do for me and us. Jesus emphasized his followers must abide in him and in them. It is a mutually intimate, conjoined union. The intricacy and the uh, interconnectedness of the relationship between Jesus and his followers is difficult to express. People talk about, well, in the Bible it says, and I have to be honest, you know what, brother? I don't understand it either. Well, how can you believe it? Well, it's God's word. Well, well I said, Who? when I get to heaven, I'll ask somebody to explain it to me. I keep praying about it now, work on the things I do understand, and pray on the things that I don't. It's difficult to express that relationship sometimes. And it's impossible to overstate it. Jesus wants his followers to abide in him as closely as he abides in them. And that's pretty close. The reason for Jesus' call to remain in him is fruitfulness. Jesus promised, promised us. We will be fruitful if we remain in Him. He reinforced this point with, a repu uh, with repetition. I was a man teacher. Man takes a lot of repetition. A lot of repetition. You, you know, there's things that you just got to practice. Uh, I always loved teaching math. And people said, why do you like math so much? And I said, I like games. Mathematics is a game. I learned the rules. I played the game. I love teaching it. I love doing it. And if I could teach you some rules, not all the rules, but the rules that will get you there, I could teach you some math. He gets on to say it first. He stated it negatively. He stated it negatively. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can he, except he abide in me. Then he repeated it in a positive way. When he said, he that abides in me, and I in him, the same bring forth much fruit. Jesus is clear. We will not be fruitful without him. And we will be fruitful with him. Stark contrast exists between serving with Christ's power and serving in our own power. Peter, and this is the one I was talking about earlier. <clears throat> Peter experienced both. Now there's no one that would have, but Peter was right there with the rest of the branches. The twelve. He was one of the branches. After authorities arrested Jesus, Peter went to the high priest's courtyard where Jesus was on trial. 
and the daughter serving her girl as Peter, if he was one of Jesus' disciples. He said he was not. While the officials were interrogating Jesus, Jesus stood, or Peter stood warming himself by a fire. He wanted to be close enough to know what was going on, but not so close that he would be associated with Jesus. Two more times, Peter denied his connection to Jesus. Peter's denial was not true. It was a lie. He was one of Jesus' twelve apostles. However, in an ironic twist, his statement had some truth to it. In that moment, he was not connected to Jesus in a metaphorical sense. Right then, Peter was operating on his own power. And he did not bear fruit. Peter's denial is a reminder that the only way to be fruitful is to reign in Jesus. I had the privilege of attending Christian college. And I knew a lot of young men that had, had um, such a strong uh, uh, dedication and commitment to follow Christ. That they wanted to be out there and they wanted to be serving for the Lord and they wanted to be preaching and reaching. They wanted to be like some other minister they'd seen. And that was the mistake. They would go out on their own. They would do their own thing. It won't be long you find out. They'd come back. Come back and win for you back. Come back in embarrassment. Why? Not because they weren't doing the Lord's work. They were doing it on their own. And I know we've all seen that. If you're not doing it, in God's plan, you're not doing it. Thankfully, the dark episode of Peter's life did not define him. Later, Peter would uh, preach a sermon where over 3,000 people were saved. Pastor, imagine 3,000 at one time coming to the Lord. What a joyous time. Not only here, but for everyone saved, you know, the, the, the angels in heaven are, are praising God. The Spirit of God fell upon those who gathered at the Pentecost celebration, and Peter preached with boldness. No longer afraid, he called on the very people who crucified Jesus to repent and become Christ's followers. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and remained in Jesus. Peter's life exemplified the truth that when the branches are connected to the vine, they will produce much fruit. You cannot go out on your own. Even if you mean to do good work, you cannot go out on your own. If God does not commission it, if God does not bless it, for lack of a better term, you cannot go out on your own. Verse 6 to 8. If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them in the fire, and they are burned. And again, this is that analogy of the vine keeper. You don't leave trash around, you clean it up, so to speak. Now, some people might say, well, uh, uh, does that mean that I'm just going to totally follow away from God? He's going to turn his back on me? No. God never leaves you. You may leave him. He doesn't leave you. But you're not part of the branch. You're not part of the vine. You're not producing fruit. you got to wake up. You don't want to be cleaned up, so to speak. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. Now, a lot of people would say that, oh, I get whatever I want because I ask. I said, whoa, 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 you got to back up. <laughs> Are you abiding in? It's what you want, something that's going to improve the kingdom of Christ on this earth. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Once the branch, excuse me, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciple, or my disciple. Once the branch is separated from the vine, it's worthless, it becomes dead, brittle, dry twigs, uh, our lives like pick those up, line them up into a vine, put little three bows, and all kinds of Christmas stuff on, hang on the door. I don't, I don't think the, the vineyards from days of old care too much about making something put on your front door. We're more concerned about cleaning it up. The branches shrivel up and the gardener, and the gardener gathers them up to be burned in the fire. Unconnected branches are good for nothing. Psalm 1 continues a parallel metaphor. The one who walks with God is fruitful like a tree planted by the river of water. But the ungodly are like the chaff which the wind drives away. The contrast is strong and makes a point. Instead of living a life that goes up in smoke, those connected to Jesus bring God glory. We bear fruit so that God is glorified and God receives the glory. We 
dump. And that's about you being in any ministry. Whether you are passing out water on a hot day on the streets of Salem, or whether you're delivering food boxes, or whatever God sends you to do, do it in His name, in His glory. And you will be successful. The moment that Randy starts taking credit, or anybody else starts taking credit for what they do in Christ, they're in trouble. It is His glory, His way, His authority, His reputation, not ours. Any fruitfulness on our part comes from being connected to Jesus, so the glory is all His and ever ours. Being fruitful for Christ is not a synonym for success. Abiding in Christ does not guarantee you will reach all of your life goals or be successful in any worldly sense. The fruit we produce in, in His power is fruitful in the way He glorifies God. Health and wealth ministry. Health and wealth ministry. You'll get whatever you want. You'll have good health. If you don't have good health, you must not be doing what you're supposed to do. Maybe you're not giving to the church what you're supposed to do. No, 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 no. no. You're not working for yourself. You're working for the Lord. And that's just going to get the honor of the Lord. He never said I was going to have the best home. He never said that I would be without health issues. Serving Christ is only guarantees one thing. It will be worth it. In heaven one day you will get your rewards, not while you're here on earth. The author has a good example. He says, during the first quarter of Super Bowl 49, Indianapolis Colts kicker, Matt Stover, pointed to the sky when he made a 38-yard field goal. That's not unusual at all. Many athletes show similar gratitude to God for their successes. But, in the fourth quarter, with the game on the line, Stover missed a 51-yard field goal attempt. Yet again, he pointed towards the sky, towards the heaven. Recognizing, recognizing the significance of this gesture, the announcer noted that Stover was a spiritual man grateful for divine blessing in success and in failure. A victory and a defeat. God is glorified. Not just because the fruit is produced, but because the fruit bearing branches, me, you, everybody else, that are Christians. Because the fruit bearing branches depend on Him no matter what. When we produce spiritual fruit, we glorify God and prove that we are Jesus' disciples. I would argue that that's over had a fruitful day. Even though he was not always successful, as he pointed to the heavens after a personal failure, he was acknowledging that it was not about him. The fact that an announcer on national TV recognized this, both in the good and the bad, he gave off God to the Lord the way he did, is amazing to himself. There was a, a witness right there who may not know it, but he saw, he saw Christ in action. He was acknowledging that he was dependent on God and he gave him the ability and the opportunity. As we live in Christ, live for Christ. We will bear fruit. And God will be glorified. Three things, three things I want to share as we come to a close. Over the years of our Author's ministry today. Many things have changed, but one thing is not. He says, I remain totally dependent on God to minister through me. I can only do the work He called me to do and produce the fruit if I remain connected to Christ. How will you join God in His work? Well, three points. Remain in Christ. Remain in Christ. Surrender your plans and choose to remain in Christ. Living in Him and His power. Pray for open eyes to see ministry opportunities He places before you. Mentor. If you are already involved in ministry, offer to mentor someone who is not. Discipline them, or excuse me, yeah. Disciple them in the discipline of abiding in Christ and help them discover how they can minister to. Thirdly, lead. If God is calling you to ministry, leadership, Accept his call. Talk with your pastor about his calling and of this calling and your next step. Let's close with your prayer. Dear Lord, as I pray many times each and every day, 
help me in whatever I do to be successful, but help me also to give you the honor and glory. Help me to be more of you and less of me. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen.